Hey, uh, I want to start by just saying thank you uh, for giving me the chance to talk with you these past few weeks. If it's your first time today, uh, we're actually wrapping up a four-week series called Simply Christian, which has looked at what Christians call the fruit of the Spirit. And, and I want to read to you uh, from the Bible what the fruit of the Spirit are. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Uh, we've seen that these values are not a target that we strive to achieve, but instead a mirror of what our life could have or could be if we just allow God to work in us, which means that the relationship with God is the goal, not religion, you know, like a list of do's and don'ts. So if you want more love, joy, or peace, we learn to be still and experience the love of God's forgiveness and the joy and the peace that his presence and the promise of heaven bring. If you want to be patient, kind, and good, reflect on God's patience, kindness, and goodness to you, and then pray that he gives you the opportunities to demonstrate those to others. Well, if you want to go deeper into any of that, you can access every week of the series in the Mech app for free. But today, we wrap up with the final three fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we'll begin with the first, faithfulness. Um, I've officiated a, a fair number of funerals, and faithfulness is clearly one of the top values that we aspire to. When we honor a life, we say things like, he was a faithful father, a faithful spouse, a faithful friend, uh, someone that you could count on, rely on. You know, if she said something, if she said that she would do something, she would do it. That's the kind of faithfulness that the fruit of the Spirit is talking about. A faithfulness that invites others to rely on us. The, the solid dependability of those who always keep their promises and finish their tasks. So what if someone said that about you? That you were a dependable person that everyone could rely on? That would feel pretty good, right? So are we faithful? Well, there isn't much data uh, on follow through with promises, but the data that we do have is not super great. Uh, take marriage, for example. When you marry someone, you vow to forsake all others and be faithful to them. But a recent study published by the Marriage and Divorce Journal stated that 70% of all Americans engage in some kind of extramarital affair, whether emotional or physical, sometime during their marital life. 70%. There was actually a small survey done on just general faithfulness, meaning a general commitment to promises. And it found that just over half of the promises that we make are kept, you know, give or take. Compare that with the faithfulness of politicians, which has actually been extensively studied since 1968. They've literally calculated how many campaign promises have been kept by American politicians. What do you think the number would be? Like 10, 20% maybe? Oh no. Try 67%, which means some of you are right now doing the math. This means, based on the data that we have, politicians are more faithful than your average American. That's depressing, right? <laughs> so what about you? You probably think that you're faithful, right? Or at least more faithful than a politician. But let's hold our lives to the faithfulness mirror and see. My wife and I, we have this recurring argument. I don't know if you ever get those with people in your life. Of course not. I mean, who has the same fight over and over and over again? That would be just immature or something. Uh, anyways, <laughs> here's our fight. Uh, and we have it all the time. I am very willing to say yes to something, even if there's a chance that we can't do it. Because as long as we explain ourselves, it's okay to change our mind or our plans. You know, people understand, just communicate to them. Uh, she, on the other hand, believes that the minute we say yes to something, we have to follow through, no matter the cost. So if there's a chance we won't be able to do it, we need to start by saying no. And then if things work out later, we can change a no to a yes. Literally, so many arguments on this one topic. Okay, now I want you to listen to what Jesus says about being faithful in the book of Matthew. It's actually a biography about Jesus written by a man named Matthew. He says, You have also heard that our ancestors were told you must not break your vows. You must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say, do not make any vows. Just say a simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. I hate when the Bible proves my wife right, uh, <laughs> uh, but she's right. The truth is that when I hold my life to the faithfulness mirror, I don't match up. Because Jesus says faithfulness is determined by one thing. Does your yes mean yes? Do, do you follow through? 
Do you give a simple, yes, I will, and then do it? And when we're honest, most of us fail the faithful mirror. And usually it's in one of two ways. First, we let the cost turn a yes to a no. And this is where I struggle with so much. I, I say yes to a lot of things. Like, yes, I can get dinner with you. Yes, I can drive you to the airport. Yes, I can help you with that work project. Yes, I can go to your ball game. Ball game. Yes, I can do that serve day at Mech. Yes, I can. And truly, I intend to. I'm not making empty promises. But then something happens. Uh, cost comes into the equation. My schedule gets really busy, and the lunch that I agreed to last week is now really inconvenient. Work was insane, and the serving role that I committed to on Saturday or Sunday, I'm gonna be honest, I just wanna rest instead. Gas prices rise dramatically, and now driving my friend to the airport costs way more than time. You, you get the idea of, of, of how this goes. So I change a yes to a no, and I have a great reason for changing my yes to a no, and I don't lie about it, I'm honest but I was unfaithful. Jesus would say, no, let your yes be yes, no matter the cost. If you say you're gonna do it, do it. But there's another type of unfaithfulness, and this is a person who says yes to things without counting the cost, and the cost itself is unfaithful. In other words, this person follows through. I mean, they are faithful to the promises that they make, but they make the wrong promises. This is when you agree to help someone move, but and takes away a day that you should have spent with your children. When you say yes to a night out with friends, but you should have gone on a date with your spouse. When you say yes to helping someone with a work project, but you should have gone to visit an elderly family member. Uh, you choose the wrong things to say yes to. There's actually a collection of wise sayings in the Bible um, called Proverbs, and one of them says this, don't trap yourself by making a rash promise to God and only later counting the cost. Now, the cost here that it's talking about is not about whether it'll cost you something, like, ooh, if it's inconvenient to me, I, I shouldn't promise it. No, no, if you joined us last week, we talked about how God calls us to serve others and be kind, regardless of the cost. But a faithful person must think through the cost to those around them, which means counting the cost takes a value system. And the Bible lays out a very specific order of values for you to use. First, the Bible says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. Your first priority should be faithfulness to God. If something costs your integrity or violates God's commands or allows you to, or, or, or allows or enables sin, it's not a yes that you should make. Second, the Bible says this, but those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith and such people are worse than unbelievers. So second, be faithful to your family. Don't say yes to anything unless it's faithfulness to God uh, that would sacrifice your family. Well, third, after you go through the values of God first and then family second, third, prioritize what will cause the most good for others. The Bible says this in the book of Ephesians, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he has planned for us long ago. That's the order. Faithful to God faithful to family, then faithful to doing good for others. And if you notice what's not included in this cost analysis, what benefits you? The writer of The Fruit of the Spirit, Paul, wrote actually this in another letter uh, whenever he said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, uh, value others above yourselves, looking not to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So, uh, hold your life to that mirror. Are you faithful? Okay, next we have gentleness. And gentleness gets a bad rap. Like, whenever I say gentle, what's the first thing you think of? It's, it's probably weak or uh, maybe pansy <laughs> or timid or a gentle giant. You know, sweet but dumb. Uh, unlike faithful, most don't want to be known as gentle. But is that the gentleness talked about in the Bible? No. Here's a picture of gentleness from the, uh, the life of Jesus, actually, as recorded in the biography written by his close friend, John. Here's what he says. Early the next morning, he, Jesus, was back at the temple. And as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, and they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned 
throw the first stone. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away, one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. And then Jesus said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, then neither do I. Go and sin no more. Gentleness isn't weakness. It's strength under control. Strength that cares for others in love and grace with respect and consideration, giving value and dignity. Jesus was within his rights as God of the universe to use his strength to condemn the woman and satisfy the crowd. But instead he challenged them, okay, before you treat this woman harshly, ask yourself, am I without sin? Would I wanna be judged the same way that I'm judging her? And the people, shamed, left. It's interesting, when I was reflecting on gentleness, I couldn't help but think, we all want others to be gentle with us, right? I mean, none of you want to be in the position of the woman, experiencing judgment and aggression. We all long for Jesus' words, I don't condemn you. But then how quickly we throw stones at others. See, we're a culture of aggression, not gentleness. Our senior pastor wrote this in a blog. He said, cars driven ridiculously fast and darting between cars like stunts on a movie set. Road rage erupting in gunfire, behavior on airplanes akin to an MMA match, school board meetings requiring police presence, social media trolling that has no bottom, nurses having to be outfitted with panic buttons, a murder rate that rose by nearly a third in 2020, the biggest increase ever recorded that rose again in 2021, even a physical assault during a presentation of an Oscar. What is wrong with people? We've forgotten what it means to be gentle. Instead, we're living lives of aggression and anger. And I spend a lot of time studying the effects of, of bullying and cyberbullying. And aggression like this causes long-lasting damage. Now, before you say, oh, yeah, yeah, but that's not me. I'm not a bully. That... Bullying refers to any of the following behaviors. Threatening, blackmailing, insulting, name-calling, playing a nasty trick, physically intimidating someone, spreading lies or rumors. All of that is normal behavior today, especially online. So what are the effects? Well, for the victims, it's what you'd expect. Increased risk of depression, anxiety, trouble sleeping, self-harm, suicidal thoughts and tendencies. The list literally goes on and on and on. But surprisingly, uh, aggression and anger also has an effect on the aggressor. Acting harshly or aggressively towards others leads to an increase in depression in men. Health issues, suicidal thoughts, higher unemployment rate, trouble making friends. Here's the headline. Behavior that has become normal today, name calling, insulting, threatening, uh, intimidating, etc. Behavior that is not gentle damages everyone, including you. But we've lost gentleness in even smaller ways. For example, how do you treat your spouse when they come home late from work again? <laughs> or another parent when they accuse your kid of doing something wrong? Are you gentle with the person who screws up your food order? Or the telemarketer that's called you 6,000 times at the worst time? Uh, the friend who canceled on you again? The teacher who gives your kid a bad grade? The family member who made that political comment? The person who posts something stupid on social media? And let's be real, it's probably the same family member, right? Are you gentle with them? You may not know this, but we just wrapped up uh, nine weeks in Met Kids studying the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Met Kids is our children's program here at Met, and it was so much fun to be able to do. We actually have a way for you to access every single lesson on demand through the Met website or the Met app so you can bring those values into your home. But when we talked about gentleness with your kids, we talked about how you know we're gentle with breakable things, like a vase or a family heirloom, but we aren't always gentle with people. So we asked the kids, why do you find it hard? Why do we find it hard to treat other people with gentleness? And this fifth grader said, well, it's easy to treat an object gently. It does whatever you want it to do, but people don't. That was insightful. <laughs> so what does gentleness look like? Well, the Bible says, uh, remind the believers, they must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show true humility 
to everyone. So hold your life to that mirror. Are you gentle? Well, finally, we have self-control. And when you think of self-control, uh, you probably think of moderation, you know, in food or drink, right? Or maybe an athlete who's mastered their body. Like, okay, I'm a huge fan of Stephen Curry. The guy is just a legend. I love watching him play. Uh, I saw this video about his training regimen and you check it out. Growing up, I was always the littlest guy on my team. Even now, I think I still am. listen to what anybody says you can't do because you know that you can. Being able to shoot is all about becoming a more complete and confident ball handler. To maximize the quickest release possible for you, lock in on the path that the ball takes from your catch ready position to your final release point. So that's how you can shoot the same from whether it's in the paint all the way out to the D3 area and knock it down. When you catch and you're ready to shoot, I look where the rim and the net meet. Put that basketball right on those hooks, and that's what I lock in on. Curry splits the defense behind the back. Fires a three. Oh, he cuts it in. Stop it right there, everyone. My defender has clearly established his lead foot. Make him open his whole body and, and create a driving angle. I have all the control, all the leverage in the world right here. Look at Ian travel though. Good gracious. <laughs> when we overload ourselves in the workout with two basketballs or a tennis ball, it makes the game seem a lot slower and you're able to process things a lot better. Ah. It might be tough. You might have to overcome a lot more than the guy next to you, but that's what makes it all worth it. <laughs> No matter where you are in your progression, we're all in the same boat. I'm still searching for perfection and full potential in this game. The time is now for you to start your journey to find ways to get better. That's why we're all here. You need to get in the gym and get to work. Time's ticking. Wow. I mean, the level of self-control that he has and the work that he puts into controlling his body, it's just, it's, it's incredible. But that's not the kind of self-control that the Bible's talking about. The Bible's concerned with mastering your impulses, restraining any evil or selfish desire. Uh, interestingly, we celebrate those who show self-control in the athletic sphere, praising uh, Simone Biles, Stephen Curry, or the soon-to-be MVP of the NFL, Christian McCaffrey. I really hope he stays healthy. Uh, but we don't always praise self-control in the moral sense. I remember hearing a late night joke about Mike Pence just mocking his commitment to his wife and his desire to avoid sexual temptation. But while we don't praise self-control, we do vilify people who lose it. I was reading in the New York Times about John Lasseter, who was the person behind the rise of Pixar, uh, working on great films like uh, Toy Story and The Incredibles. He then was key in reviving Disney Animation Studios and was part of the production of Frozen. Uh, but then came allegations of inappropriate workplace conduct, ranging from unwanted physical touch to disrespectful and uncomfortable language, and he was ousted. Now, whatever you feel about him or that, the truth is that when you lose self-control and act in a way that is out of control, the consequences can be devastating. And nobody wants to suffer those consequences. So how do we master our worst impulses? The Bible tells us exactly how, and it's not what you'd expect. Uh, listen to this. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Control the words you speak or text or post. And if you can control those, you'll have self-control in every area of your life. Do you agree with that? I didn't <laughs> uh, until I really thought about it. Think about every self-control failure that really matters. They start with your tongue. Every adulterous affair starts with a flirty conversation. Every toxic workplace begins with angry comments that go unchecked. Every marital fight or friendship snafu or racist act begins with words that we say. Words precede action, which is why if you could control this, you can control everything about yourself. There's a neuroscientist, Dr. Newberg, who studies the power of words on the brain. And I thought it was fascinating what he wrote. He said, 
By holding a positive and optimistic word in your mind, you actually stimulate the frontal lobe activity, which connects directly to the motor cortex that's responsible for moving you into action. Words cause action. Words have power. And the Bible agrees. Listen to this from the book of Proverbs again in the Bible. It says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise bring healing. Our words matter. So what does it look like to have self-control? Well, uh, to get a picture of it, uh, let's go to a letter that Paul wrote. He's the same guy who wrote the fruit of the spirit, is a Christian missionary uh, from the first century. And this is what he wrote to a church in Corinth. He said, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. And you, uh, so that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's a picture of self-control. Seeing what's beneficial, what's good for others, and what will bring glory to God. And then saying that and that alone. But we don't do that. Most of us filter what we say through what is allowed. For example, technically, you're allowed to flirt with a coworker, but is it beneficial? Is it good for your marriage? No. You're allowed to get angry, but are your words when you're angry good, helpful, God-honoring? The key idea is this. The life of self-control doesn't ask, okay, what's allowed or what's legal or what's excusable? The life of self-control asks what is helpful, good for others, and glorifying to God, which means, not all of your feelings should be shared. And I know that sounds crazy to say, right? But self-control says don't vomit every thought onto the people around you. Have self-control over what you say. Now, imagine if you did this for everything. If you ask before you say, share, or post something, is this helpful? Is it good? And does it bring God glory? <laughs> when we talked about this and met kids, one kid responded, what? If I did that, I would barely say anything at all. Yeah. That's a wise kid. Hold your life up to that mirror. Do you have self-control? Well, let's end today with three practical steps you can take to bring these values, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control into your life. First, become aware of who you are in light of who God is. Now, now this same may seem weird, but let's just talk about faithfulness, for example. Uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it's a wisdom book in the Bible, uh, we read this. Don't make rash promises. Don't be hasty in bringing matters before God. After all, God is in heaven, you are on earth. So keep all the promises you make. God is in heaven, you are on earth. God is the creator of the cosmos, all powerful, all knowing, all loving, and you are not. Now, it's uncomfortable to think about ourselves in this way. I mean, so much of our day talks about our worth and seeing our value. And, and, and I'm going to be honest, you do matter. We matter. But you are not God. David, uh, a king, wrote this uh, in a song. He said, When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place, what are mere mortals that you, God, should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. You see, whenever we're unfaithful or not gentle or lose self-control, it flows from how we view ourselves. I mean, think about this. For faithfulness, if I say yes, but then later realize, oh, that, that, that cost is too much for me, uh, and then I change my yes to a no, what I'm really saying is that my desires and my convenience are more important than God's call to be faithful. But if I saw myself and God as we truly are, my desires would become secondary to the creator of the cosmos and this call on my life. And, and it's the same with gentleness. In his, in his encounter with the woman caught in adultery, Jesus challenged, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. In other words, you're not God. <laughs> you're a sinner. You have no right to judge someone harshly. And self-control, your first priority should be to say only the things that bring God glory. Do you see how this all plays out? When you live in reverence for who God is and a deep understanding that you are not God, you submit yourself to him. Submit. That's uncomfortable, right? Because power on earth is always abused. So when you submit to others, they'll likely use you for their own gain, right? I mean, those in power prosper 
and those in submission suffer. We don't like to submit, but that's not how it works with God. One of the most famous verses in the entire Bible uh, comes from this. It's God's promise to one of his followers. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, and they are plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. God is a loving father, unlike any that any of us have ever experienced, and he wants only the best for you. So yes, submit to God, but remember, he is good. Well, after you become aware of who you are and you submit to who God is, understand who other people are. We actually talked about this last week by looking at uh, one of the first verses written in the entire Bible from the book of Genesis chapter one. It says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And our picture for each of the values um, there was actually one piece of wisdom that was repeated over and over again uh, for faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So let me just kind of take you back to what was said. Uh, In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. When you see others as made in the very image of God himself, and that's what the Bible tells us that they are, of course you would be faithful. Of course you'd be gentle and in control of yourself. Why? Because you would want to put them first. That, that's the way that you treat someone who is precious and, and valuable, an image bearer of God himself. Well, finally, uh, remember that the easiest way to be faithful, gentle, and to have self-control is to hold your tongue. Uh, don't say yes without counting the cost. Don't judge or say harsh words. Don't say everything that comes into your head. The Bible cracks me up with how it, it talks about this. Um, listen to this. Uh, the book of Proverbs that we've read a couple verses from says, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> I love the way the Bible is. Uh, so that's the fruit of the Spirit. Nine values. Nine marks of the Simply Christian life laid out in the book of Galatians in the Bible. And I want to end our time together the same way that Paul, that first century Christian missionary who wrote these words, ended his letter of Galatians. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. And since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So let's not get tired of doing what's good, At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. So may God's peace and his mercy be upon all who live by this principle, for they are the new people of God. Dear brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen.